Hello and welcome. We're so glad that you joined us today. If you'd like more information about the church, messages, or how to get involved, please visit pottershouse.org. Now enjoy today's message. I'm so glad I serve a shepherd who leaves the 99 to find the one. Yeah, he does. Would you lift your hands one more time? Do you feel the presence of the Lord? I feel the presence of the Lord here. I feel the presence of the Lord here. Father, I thank you for your spirit that we feel, that we feel here in this room. And God, I pray that as we read your word, as we open up the book of life, that we would see, hear, and feel you drawing us near. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said amen and amen. You can be seated today in the presence of the Lord. I I really hope that you never take this for granted. I'm not talking just simply about our gathering. I'm talking about his presence. It's not like this everywhere. It's not like this everywhere. And I stand here today, a campus pastor, honoring our lead pastor because my father... And my mother have built a culture where there's a hunger after the presence of God. And we cannot do what we do without this. We can do without the cameras. We can do without the fancy equipment. We can't do it without his presence. You, as a believer cannot live a life found in the Bible without his abiding presence. You cannot do it. My thought for today as we get ready to get into the word is the communion of the Holy Spirit. I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 13 with me if you have your Bibles. I've got one verse and then we're going to extrapolate and move around the Bible for a little bit. Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. As always, I love being here with you. I love the opportunity to be here with you. My wife, my family, my children, being here, seeing familiar faces. But I didn't come to see you. Now, don't get offended. I came to see Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Let's read that together. One, two, three. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, And the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. This week as I prayed, my family and I, we were out of town. This year was my parents' 40th anniversary. And we went on a trip together out of town to rest, to reset, to finish the year off strong. And as my wife and I left a few days early to go and visit some friends in Charlotte, North Carolina. And as I was driving, as we were Uh, Moving down the road, I was listening to worship music, and you know, I don't. How many of you have traveled with toddlers before? They play tricks on you because we put the comfortable car seat in the van, and our toddler didn't sleep one time. Uh, And our and our little baby Gwen, she slept for thirty minutes each way, and our foster son Tobin, he slept the whole time. So, favorite stat? No, I'm just kidding. But on this 
journey, on this trip we took, I was listening to some worship music. I was praying. I was resetting myself. And as the week went on, I was looking to this day and what the Lord would say to us. And I just kept hearing the Holy Spirit just say, commune with me. Commune with me. And as I did that myself, I began to understand what he wanted me to say today. The definition of, of the word communion, it means to fellowship, to have close mutual association, partnership, or to be married. We oftentimes do not understand the communion of the Holy Spirit. The communion of the Holy Spirit. And in order to understand the communion of the Holy Spirit, you have to understand what Paul said first. As he was closing out his letter to the church of Corinth, he stated the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and then the communion of the Holy Spirit. It is impossible to have communion or fellowship with the Holy Spirit without the grace of Jesus and the love of God. Yes, I'll preach to myself. It is impossible. The Holy Spirit could have not come had Jesus not shown grace and love on Calvary. Had Jesus not ascended. And so to understand the grace of Jesus. The Bible said in, in he, Ephesians 1 and 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood. We just talked about it, sang about it a minute ago. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, what? According to the riches of his grace. In Ephesians 2 and 8, the Bible said, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God. How many of you understand grace is a gift? I didn't earn it. I certainly don't deserve it, but he gave it to me anyways. It's a gift. Titus 2.11, for the grace of God appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Romans 3.24, he said, you're justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So to understand the grace of Jesus Christ and then the love of God. In John 3.16, the Bible said, for God what? So loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but what? Have everlasting life. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 7, one of my favorite verses in the scripture, the Bible said, for scarcely for a just man would one die. And even more scarcely for a good man might another die but God see this is the love of God because he is defining man's love he is saying for an upright man some may die there might be somebody that would give themselves up and for a good man there's even less people that would give themselves up but God commended his love toward us not when I was just not when I was good not when I had it all together but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, uh, Christ died for us much more than being now justified by his blood. We have been saved from wrath through him. In Romans chapter 8. In verse 35, beginning, the Bible said, Who can separate us from the love of God shall peril, tribulation, famine, nakedness, sword. For it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long and accounted as sheep for the slaughter. But nay, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord and so Paul is saying if you want to have communion with the Holy Spirit you must understand the grace of Jesus and the love of God is what makes a way for the communion of the Holy Spirit the communion of the Holy Spirit so one of the definitions is the word fellowship in Galatians 2 and 9, Paul said, When James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. What, what he was saying is they took Paul into their communion. Paul became a partner in the work and the work of the gospel. 
Then the word partnership in Luke 5 10 we see and so also were James and John the sons of Zebedee who were partners with Simon. So in this case they were part owners together and so when they would go fishing they would not just say this is my boat they would say this is our boat this is the boat that James John and Simon are partners in this is the business we are partners in and so the scripture would read like this the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship and partnership of the Holy Spirit be with you all Let's talk about fellowship for a minute. Number one, fellowship is an act of surrender. In James 4 and 7, he said, submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You've heard Pastor Oldfield say the level of your submission to God will determine your ability to resist the devil. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Proverbs 23, 26, he said, my son, give me your heart. And embrace fully what I'm about to tell you. So fellowship with the Holy Spirit is surrender to the Holy Spirit. It is surrendering to his character. Surrendering to his nature. Surrendering to the high call of the Holy Spirit. Then number two, fellowship is an act of hosting. Everybody say hosting. Host. Y'all, that was weak. So I said say hosting. Okay, that was a little bit. That's what I expect from now on, all right? Okay, we're on the same page. Cool. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? We carry the, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We carry the Holy Spirit, but we must every day make a decision to host him. Make a decision to fellowship with him. You, you read in the Bible when Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 was b baptized in the Jordan. And the Bible said that the Holy Spirit like a dove descended upon him and stayed. And stay. I always inf infatuated with that and stayed. Stayed. The Holy Spirit stayed. Jesus made a decision to host him. You read, if you read the Gospels, you will read that many times the Bible said as often as he did, he went into a secluded place and he fellowshiped with God through the Holy Spirit. Now, if you are any any sort of a bird person, you understand that the dove is one of the most sensitive birds that there are. And so if you are going to host the dove, you have got to be sensitive to the dove. There are certain places you won't go with the dove on your shoulder. There are certain things you won't watch with the dove on your shoulder. There are certain things you won't say with the dove on your shoulder. There are certain things, there's a certain level that you won't let your voice get to with your spouse with the dove on your shoulder. There's certain things that you won't put on the computer screen with the door, the dove on your shoulder. And the dove has always been looking for a place to rest. In the Bible, in Genesis, when the flood came, the Bible said that Noah released a raven and he released released a dove and the dove was going and if the dove didn't come back what it had found somewhere to rest and from the time of Noah from the time of Jesus until now the Holy Spirit like a dove is still looking for a place to rest he is still looking for a suitable place to rest whether it is your life personally whether it is your house whether it is a corporate gathering the dove is still looking for a place that is ready to host him I remember reading a book by an author named Tommy Tenney the preacher it's called God Chasers and he tells a story in this book where he had a he had a friend a pastor friend who had a medical condition and it made him overweight he, in fact in his book he said he was a big man and he would talk to this man and and you know, he would go through and he, he, Tommy Tenney said this man had a propensity that wherever he went, when he would, he was a pastor, and wherever he would go in to visit people's homes, he would go and he would sit down and he had a propensity and a history to break chairs in people's homes because he was so big, no fault of his own. And so he was sitting in the car one day with Tommy Tenney, and he said to him, he said, Tommy, he said, I'm at this point where if I walk into someone's house, and I don't find a chair that can hold me. 
I don't stay very long. And he said, I'm tired of breaking chairs. I think the Holy Ghost is tired of coming into places who say they want his glory, but they have no chair that can hold his weight. He's tired of flying into places that say you can have a home here, but there's been no preparations made. The four walls might be put up, but there's no chair that can hold the kavod. And so he comes into churches, he comes into rooms, he comes into houses, and before he stays, he surveys the room. And he says, is there a chair here that can hold me? And if there's a chair here that can hold me, I'll stay. But I'm t I believe the Holy Ghost is done breaking chairs. He is done coming in and being embarrassed by the, by the, by the puniness of man. That we say that God, we're ready for you, but we're still not living holy. We're ready for you, but we're still not living in repentance. We're ready for you, but we're still, we're still holding back praise. And we're still holding back worship. And we're not praying and fasting like we ought to. And he's tired of coming into places uh, that say we've got a we got a place for you to rest and he sits and the chair breaks and if I'm gonna host the Holy Ghost I gotta have a chair that is built good enough to hold him to hold him the dove came and stayed on Jesus I don't know about you but I come to this place this morning and I want the dove to stay with me I want him to stay with me. The, the, the Holy Ghost, we read in Acts chapter 2, and that just seems to be the place where most people stop reading, especially Pentecostals. Because we love to shout, we love to dance, we love to speak in tongues, we love to huck and buck, we love to throw babies and bounce our bobby pins out of our hair. But we don't understand how we host the Holy Ghost in our homes, how we host the Holy Spirit in our bedroom, how do we host the Holy Spirit in our kitchen, how do we host the Holy Spirit at the dining room table when our family and our children are sitting around us? How do we host the Holy Spirit? spirit we've got to build him a room like the woman who built Elijah an upper room an upper room in the house and it was in the upper room where healing was it was like the upper room in Acts 2 when you build a room for the Holy Spirit when you build a place for the Holy Spirit and it is enough to handle his weight you have found a place where he will stay. I don't know about you. There's about six of you that responded. I just want the Holy Ghost to stay. Take everything from me. I just want the Holy Ghost to stay. Hmm. And, and so, so to fellowship with him, I feel him in the room. To fellowship with him will lead to partnership with him. Somebody say partnership. Number one, we are partnering with his glorious person. The Holy Spirit is not some ambiguous being. He is not just some ghost. The Holy Ghost is a person. He has a personality. He has will. He has a goal. He has understanding. He grieves. He has emotions. He is a person. And until I stop looking at him as just this floating being, and I begin to look at him as somebody I can talk to, somebody I can walk with, somebody I can talk with. I'll never understand the full potential of the Holy Spirit. And one of the problems in the body of Christ today is we have abused his power without knowing his person. Tell me how it is that we can preach and we can prophesy and still be addicted to pornography. Tell me how it is that we can be so gifted and yet so bound. Because we have become accustomed to being used and not knowing him. We have become accustomed to the oil being on us from Sundays from 9 until 1. And then it lifts and all we know is how to be used and not how to commune. All we know is how to do our dance but not how to commune with the Holy Spirit we've abused his power we could preach we could prophesy we can move in words of wisdom and words of knowledge and we can move in gifts of healing and word of faith and we can move in all of the gifts of the Spirit and still not know him 
still we treat the Holy Spirit when we do that like he's a sugar daddy we go to him for money and we turn around and leave all the while not understanding that he is grieved that his person is mourning because he wants to know us and on the day of Pentecost they were not waiting for power they were waiting for a person and when the person came the power came with him okay to the four people who get it when the person came so then came the power okay so his importance john chapter 14 verse 16 and 17 jesus said i'll pray the father and he will give to you another comforter that he may abide with you forever the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him but you know him for he dwells with you and he will be in you the word another i need you to pay attention with me and track with me here for a minute the word another in this scripture is the greek word allos and this word means to be of the same kind or equal quality so what Jesus was saying was, I'm going to send you a spirit that is of equal quality to the one I carry. I'm going to send you the same spirit that I carry. The, can I help you understand something? It is not that God is above Jesus and Jesus is above the Holy Spirit. They are all God in three beings and they are all God together. It is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost on the same level. Jesus did not send, listen to me, Jesus did not send us 19 variations of the Holy Spirit. He did not send us a children's Holy Spirit. He did not send us a youth Holy Spirit. He did not send us an older people Holy Spirit. He did not send us a millennial Holy Spirit. He said, I'm going to send you another. I'm going to send you a spirit of the same kind and quality that I've carried on me for these three years you've walked with me. And what I do, you shall do greater. Ah. Uh. So Jesus is making the Holy Spirit's coming vital for the believer. In John 16, 7, Jesus said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. I want you to hear the words of Jesus. This is not the words of David. It's not the words of, this is Jesus. I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I get out of here. Because if I don't go, the helper will not come. But if I depart, I'll send them to you. One translation says, it's better for you that I get out of here. So when I leave, the helper can come. And, 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 and we sit here, and it, it should be the cry of every believer's heart, even so come, Lord. Even so come, Lord. But we can become so, even so come, Lord, that we are bad stewards of what he sent us to steward. We got awfully quiet that we are bad stewards of the spirit that Jesus sent us. And he said to his disciples, I need you to occupy until I come. And we cannot occupy if we don't have him. We cannot do business if we don't have him. We cannot keep the doors open if we don't have the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, it's to your advantage. Why is it to your advantage? Because up until now, the disciples had watched Jesus heal the sick. They had watched Jesus raise the dead. They had watched Jesus open blind eyes. They had watched Jesus do all the teaching. And now Jesus is saying, you are not going to have me to rely on doing this anymore. More. I'm going to send a helper to you and you are going to do it and you're going to do it and you're going to do greater than what I did if you're with me say I'm there so so do you understand that Jesus ascension was vital to the church So we find his importance. It is vital for the Holy Spirit to live among us to be among us It's vital that the Holy Spirit is a part of my life it's vital that I'm not just Pentecostal on Sunday morning. Hmm. So his importance, then secondly, his integrity. He is the spirit of truth. His nature is truth. 
in a world full, I don't care who coined this, what you think about them or not, in a world full of fake news, the Holy Ghost is truth. And his word is truth. And what we as a church, we will be baited into arguments, will be baited into unbelief if we fail to fall in love with truth. Mm. Let me help you. In a couple weeks, we're going to vote. Some of you may already have. We're going to vote. And we're going to elect a president. You know what happened in heaven? God will stay on his throne. Whether your earthly king uh wins or not, the king of heaven will stay firmly planted on his throne. Ah, but if you don't read your Bible, they said they that trust in the Lord will be as Mount Zion, which cannot be moved. But about, so if you trust in Fox, in CNN, Fox News, CNN, and all the mainstream junk, if you trust in anything more than you trust in the Bible, you'll be a double-minded person, unstable in all of your ways. He is the spirit of truth. And every time I open the Bible, I read things I don't like. I read things that hurt. I read things that prick my heart. But he's the spirit of truth. And when he says something to me about me, it's incumbent upon me to trust him. Because he knows me better than I know me. John 16, 13. However, when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. Can I help you understand something? He is the spirit of truth and the bride must fall in love with the spirit of truth again and get her discernment back. Yeah. You can see something with your natural eye, but that doesn't mean what you see is what God thinks about it. We need our discernment back, and we don't need the discernment of man. We need the discernment of the Holy Spirit because he is the spirit of truth. There has never been a time in the existence of God that he has ever told a lie. He won't start now. However, when the spirit of truth has come, he'll guide you into all truth. The word truth here means what is true in things pertaining to God, the duties of man, moral and religious truth. The Holy Spirit is not only the greatest revealer of Jesus, he is the greatest revealer of idolatry in my life. Because when he reveals Jesus, I begin to look at him and I begin to see what things about me are out of order as it pertains to him. He is leading us into all truth. A.W. Tozer, it's what, what is true pertaining to things of God. A.W. Tozer said the most important thing a Christian can do is to think rightly about God. Jeremiah 16, 20, can people make for themselves their own gods? These are not real gods. Colossians 3 and 2, put to death therefore what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. The Holy Spirit has not changed. He has not changed. And if you really fall in love and commune with the Holy Spirit, he will not let you have an idol above Jesus. Mm -hmm. So number one, we see his importance, we see his integrity, and then we see his goal. I'm going to make it real simple for you. His goal is Jesus. That's it. His goal is not, for you, not to get you to have a goosebump, speak in tongues, shake and dance, do all that. His goal is Jesus. Jesus is the Holy Spirit's favorite subject. Jesus is the only message that God has ever preached. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, which means Jesus embodies God the Father. Huh? He's told his disciples, when you see me, you have seen the Father. He embodies God the Son because he is. And he embodies God the Holy Spirit. Jesus, in him dwelleth all the fullness of 
of the good. Do you want to know how much Jesus meant to the Father? The Bible said that the heavens and the earth, all things were created by him and listen, for him. The heavens, the earth, the galaxies, the, the galaxies that we have not even uh, uh, uncovered yet, they were created as a gift for Jesus. That's how much the Father loves the Son, and in Him dwells the fullness, the, the entirety of the Godhead bodily. All things, were, all things were made by Him and for Him, and by Him all things consist and are held. If Jesus ever stopped being, everything would fall apart. You look at 2020 and say, things have fallen apart. No, baby, they haven't fallen apart. They won't fall apart so long as Jesus exists, because in Him consists all things, and all things are held together. And when the Holy Ghost comes, whether it's in a corporate gathering or whether it's in your prayer closet or whether it's in your prayer time, what he does is he magnifies Jesus. He makes Jesus known in our midst. John 15, 26, he'll testify of me. The word testify means to be a witness, give testimony or bear record. In John 16, verse 12, he said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he'll guide you in all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears in heaven, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me. The word glorify means to magnify, to celebrate, to make renown, to render illustrious, to cause the dignity and worth of some person or thing to become manifest and acknowledged. It is no wonder that on the day of Pentecost when they were filled with this same Holy Ghost, that in Acts chapter 2 and 22, that Peter stood up and said, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus was a man attested unto you by God by the miracle signs and wonders that he worked in your midst, and you know this yourselves and he being being given up by the predestined for knowledge and purpose of God you crucified him and put him to death but God has raised him up and loosed him from the pangs of death for it is not possible that he should be holding of it in Acts chapter 2 and 33 31 beginning rather the Bible speaking of David saying he foreseeing this spoke concerning his resurrection that his soul would not see Hades and his flesh would not see corruption and God has raised up Jesus of which we are all witnesses and now he is exalted to the right hand of God and he has received the promise of the Holy Spirit and he pours out that which you now see and hear it is no wonder that on the day the church was birthed when the Holy Ghost fell that the only thing Peter could talk about was Jesus the only thing they could sing about was Jesus the only thing he could tell them about was Jesus. It wasn't about how to get better. It wasn't about how to get rich. It wasn't about how to grow their money and grow their 401k. It was about Jesus crucified. Jesus lived a perfect life. Jesus was buried in a borrowed tomb. Three days later, Jesus got up from the grave and ascended to the right hand of the Father where he lives forever to intercede for you and me. It's all about Jesus. That's why when we sing about him, we feel the shift in the atmosphere. Because when the Holy Ghost hears the name Jesus, he's got to come. In Acts chapter 10, 44, I'm confident that if the church of Jesus would get back to preaching him, we would have more outpourings of the Holy Ghost. Because the Bible said in Acts 10, 44, that while Peter preached Jesus, the Holy Ghost fell. And they spoke in tongues. They were filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke in tongues and magnified God. While Peter yet speak, huh? the Holy Ghost fell. Huh. Because it's all about Jesus. It's all about him. Never been about nothing else. I know that was terrible English. But that's all right. It's never been about anything else. It's always been about him. And when he comes, when the Holy Ghost comes, he might use a preacher. 
He might use a dance. He might use a song. He might use a tongue. He might use a prophecy. But whatever he uses is unto this to make Jesus known. What he uses is unto this uh, to glorify Jesus uh, and to make the dignity and the worth of one who shed his blood on the cross uh, and sits enthroned upon the praises of people lifted high in the room. <sighs> yeah, that's his goal. That's his goal. That's his goal. That's why the next move of God will not be led by celebrities. That's why the next move of God is not going to be led by well-known people. The next move of God is going to be led by people like you and me in our prayer closets. Uh, getting a revelation of Jesus and taking Jesus to the streets uh, and bringing Jesus to the church. Uh, and watching God pour out his spirit because it all became about Jesus. He's the one the Bible said he's got fire in his eyes. His hair is white like wool. His feet are like fine brass. And out of his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword. And his voice is like the sound of many waters. He is the one the Bible said in Revelation 21 that he will come riding on a white horse. And on his thigh is written a name that no one knows. And, the, and he's got a name that is the word of God. The Bible said he's the word of God. And they will exalt him. And he treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of of God and on his thigh is written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It is that Jesus that the Holy Spirit causes his dignity and worth to be manifest in the room. In Luke chapter 24, Jesus is walking with two disciples who are completely oblivious to who he is. And they're on the road of Emmaus. And the Bible said as they're walking, Jesus is opening up the scripture. And the Bible said he started in Moses uh, and expounded on the prophets uh, and the law and the psalmist uh, and all the scripture that points to him. And he's walking and he's preaching to them about himself. And the Bible said that they showed up to the house of Emmaus, uh, the house in Emmaus, uh, and Jesus was about to go on further. But they said, no, no, there's something about you. You've got to stay with us. I need you. I need to restrain you you've got to stay in this house with us and the bible said he walked into the house he sat down with them and he broke bread and blessed it and when they had eaten their eyes were open and jesus disappeared and listen they said to one another let me translate what the church in america often says did not i cry many tears did not we speak in many tongues? Was not that worship phenomenal? Didn't that preacher preach great? That's what we say when we go and say, oh, we had a great service today. They sat in a household. They didn't talk about the tongues. They didn't talk about the prophecy. They didn't talk about the preaching. They didn't talk about the worship. They looked at one another and they said, did not our hearts, did not our hearts burn within us when he came alongside? Can I help you? Jesus is not really interested in how good you can talk in tongues. He's not really interested in how well you can prophesy. He's not interested in how good our worship is or how good our preaching is. What he is interested in. When I came, did you open up your heart and let me do a work there? We are really good at the emotional work. We are really good at the Pentecostal work. But we're really bad at the heart work. Jesus was not coming after the Pentecostalism. It hadn't even happened yet. Jesus left the room and they said, did our hearts not burn within us as he walked with us on the way? And I believe with everything in me that the barometer and the way we judge our churches is shifting. It's no longer about what you have to offer. If you don't have Jesus, what you have to offer will fade. Yep, yep. 
the barometer from this point forward ought to be was Jesus in the room and did I let him do in my heart what he wanted to do in my heart and you know what happens when we do that we come in we go into the prayer closet Monday morning and we constrain him to stay I felt what I felt yesterday on Sunday, but I know I can feel it today. Would you come into this Emmaus? Tuesday, we get up. Would you come into this Emmaus? Wednesday, would you come into this Emmaus? My heart is burning. My heart is on fire. You did something in me. You started something in me. Will you come? And we cannot experience Holy Ghost heartburn without the Holy Spirit. He leads us to Jesus. He reveals Jesus. If you're with me, say, I'm there. If you want more of the Holy Ghost, say yes. All right. If you're going, uh, I'm not going to do that. We partner with his glorious person, and then I got to hurry. We partner with his glorious work. How many of you have ever partnered with someone? Whether you're partnering in workout, you're partnering in a business, you're, you part, if you're married, you're in a partnership. I'm not going to get started there, but you're in a partnership. When you partner with someone, you share a common interest. You share a common interest. One of the things, I, I mentioned workouts, because whenever I have partnered with anybody working out, we don't have a common interest. Their goal is to lose weight. Mine is just to stay alive. <laughs> Come on. But when you partner with someone, the goal is the common interest. Can I help you understand something? That if your interests are found here, you got to partner in the Holy Ghost with a common interest. Do you love Jesus? So does the Holy Spirit. Do you want to live a holy life? The Holy Spirit wants you to. Do you love to pray? The Holy Spirit loves praying. Do you, do you love, uh, do, do, you, do you want Jesus to come? Yeah? The Spirit and Bride say what? Come. Do you want Jesus to come? So does the Holy Spirit. You have a common interest. His glorious work through the shared common interest and then His glorious work through His Bride. First, the unity of the Bride. Can I help you understand something? The Holy Spirit makes us equal. I will start there. He makes us equal no matter where you've come from, no matter what you've done. The Holy Spirit uses who he chooses. I'm, Jesus does not ask permission for who he can use and who he can't. He makes us equal. But more than he makes us equal, he makes us one. He makes us one. Unity is God using his church. I want, to, I want you to hear me. Unity is God using his church to show the world what the wonder and power of the blood can do. The church ought to be the place that looks like heaven and therefore cities ought to be places that look like heaven. Homes ought to be places that look like heaven. And, 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 and the world ought to look at the church this house and have to ask themselves who's lying revelation 5 he redeemed us every tribe every kindred every nation every tongue he's redeemed us by his blood somebody who's not saved ought to walk into this church and ask themselves who's lying. Because if you listen to mainstream media, all black people hate white people, and all white people hate black people, and all Hispanics hate this, and Asians hate this, and people hate this. Come on, you know I'm telling the truth. Ah, huh? but then they walk in the church, and this worship team gets to humming, and every tribe. And every kindred, and every tongue, and every people, 
and every nation are united together lifting up a song to the Lamb who is seated on the throne. And all week, all they've been hearing is, is everybody hates everybody and everybody's a racist. But they walk into the church and they see white and black and Asian and Hispanic. And, and, and you name it, you see them. They're in the room. And somehow, some way, they're smiling. They're loving on each other. They look like they love being here. And they're lifting up a soul. And they leave wondering who is lying. Who is the one who's telling the fib? Is it Fox News? Is it CNN? Or is it this church that I came into and they're all singing one song? Somebody's lying. And unity, let me help you. Unity is not sameness. Unity is the celebration of diversity. If everybody looked like me, talked like me, we would be a boring and ineffective church. But because I'm me and you're you and I came up different than you did and you came up different than I did, rich, poor, uh, 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 rich, poor, fathered, fatherless, mothered, motherless, family, it doesn't matter. Here's what matters. We were all sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore very deeply stained within sinking to rise no more then that course that love lifted me we have this commonality that our sameness is not found in our personality our sameness is not found in the way we do things our unity is found in that we are all different we think different we came up different but the cross of Jesus Christ gives us a single goal to reach the lost to know Jesus and to make him known so we partner with the Holy Spirit in becoming one together becoming one Acts 2 verse 1 when they were all together on the day of Pentecost they were in one place in one accord I want you to say these words say together 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 they were together 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 and unfortunately too often in the church we're together but we're not together unfortunately the church especially this year and especially because of elections is the most divided place in America and people laugh at the church people scoff at the church because how are you going to fix our problems when you guys can't even talk to each other How are you going to fix our issues if you can't even talk about an election that is so temporal, important, very, very, very important, but so temporal, and you can't even sit down and have a conversation about it without getting mad at each other. You can't scroll, I'm going to get in trouble. You can't scroll past a Facebook post without feeling the need to comment. How are you going to fix their problem? when we can't even fix ours. I'll tell you why. In church on a Sunday morning, most people have a different king than King Jesus. I'm going to go longer than we normally do. I do this all the time. Sorry. But most people's God is their watch. Some people's God is whether they like the worship or not. Some people, your God is whoever you're going to vote for in the election. They were together together because they had one king. And his name was Jesus. And they all had commonality. In that they walked with him, they talked with him, they breathed with him, they supped with him. They watched him die, they saw him rise again, they saw him ascend. They were together, together, and to partner with the Holy Spirit is to offer him a church who is one. Jesus prayed in John 17, Lord, make them one as you and I are one. Okay. And we partner with him in being, having love one toward another. 
John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you. That you see, we love shouting, we love dancing, we love speaking in tongues. But when we talk about this stuff, I was about to end this message about 10 minutes ago, but I felt the Holy Spirit say, keep going. Because we love, we love the moving of the Holy Spirit, but what about the work of the Holy Spirit right here? That's what I'm talking to you about today. The work of the Holy Spirit right here when you fellowship with him. We partner with a united with, with bringing him a church of unity, and we partner with bringing him a church of love. John 13, 34, 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all, everybody shout all. All will know that you are my disciples if you have loved one for another. The scripture, I want you to read your Bible. The scripture said, well, let me start with what the scripture didn't say. The scripture didn't say you will, they will know you by your love for them. That's not what the Bible said. The Bible said, they will know you're my disciples, that you love one another. To be the picture, Pastor Joel and I didn't grow up anywhere near each other. Different upbringings, different homes, but I love him. I, love, I can say that about everybody in here, especially those that I know. I'm able to love because that's what Jesus said is going to be the flashing light to the world that you are different. That you love one another. The problem, oh Lord Jesus, the problem is we have been raised in a society that tells us that any sort of confrontation is hate. confronting the biblical definition of marriage that it is true and it is right you confront that with a certain group of people it's hate come on now you stand up for religious liberties in this country people say oh it's hate and for some people y'all some people are really hateful when they comment stuff you don't you don't need a fresh tongue you need love Oh, Jesus. <laughs> you need love. Paul said, speaking the truth in love. It's entirely possible to confront a stronghold in someone's life and do it in love. Mm -hmm. We don't know how to do conflict, especially in 2020. My goodness. Jesus said, if you have aught with your brother, don't even bring your gift to the altar. Go deal with that. Go take, talk to your brother. And if he won't receive you, take another. And if he won't receive you, then take him to the church. If you win him over, you've gained a brother. I, I've, I've been in ministry the majority of my life. Youth pastored for five years, five and a half years. I don't have time to do the math. Now pastoring in, in, in that position for three and a half so years, almost four. And I cannot tell you the amount of times people bring conflict to me and haven't even talked to the person they got out with. Y'all are like, I thought he was preaching about the Holy Ghost. This is the Holy Ghost. And I tell our church all the time, if you have not done Matthew 18 and Matthew 5, or Matthew 6, rather. Don't come talk to me. Because if you can't obey the Bible, there is nothing I'm going to say to you that is going to make a difference. You can confront in love. And he said, this is how, what would the world think about a church who knew how to disagree but yet go after the same goal? Who knew how to love each other in spite of each other? They would have no choice but to step back and say, they are different. Mm, got awfully quiet in this church. And here's the principle. It is impossible for me to love Jesus more and love you less. If you start loving people less, you're actually loving Jesus less. It's impossible for me to go deeper in God and love somebody less. Do you hear me? 
Y'all with me still? Okay, cool, cool. Then lastly, we partner with the Holy Spirit in presenting him a pure, spotless bride. 2 Corinthians 11.2, Paul said, I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband to Christ so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. Ephesians 5.27, that he might present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy without blemish. We partner with the Holy Spirit to present Jesus a pure bride. I'm not just talking about purity sexually, although we need that in the body of Christ. More than ever today, we need that. I'm talking purity in your motives. Your motives. The, the, the reason you do things. You need a purity there. Purity in your political ideologies. It's okay to think a certain way as long as it aligns with the scripture. If you think a way politically that doesn't align with the Bible, your political ideologies are impure. Hmm. If you're offended, take it up with God. I'm not telling you anything that you shouldn't already know. We need purity in the way that we vote. In the way that we communicate with one another during this season. And, and, and if we align ourselves with the word, purity is the natural outcome of that. Purity in our worship. God, I, I don't want to be seen. I, I want to see you. I want you to be exalted. Purity in prayer. God, I'm not coming to gain anything from you. I'm coming to fellowship with you. I'm coming to commune with you. And what the world needs is a, a church with a standard. What the world needs is a church with a backbone. A believer with a standard stands out. A believer that says, I'm not going to do that. Because the Bible tells me not to do that. And sin separates me from God. And to be disobedient to his word is going to separate me from... i got a standard... And the whole crowd may be going this way, but I, I'm going this way. The standard of holiness, the standard of righteousness, the standard of purity. The Holy Spirit, His job is to present Jesus with a purified bride. Can you imagine how many times the Holy Spirit has wanted to present Jesus, His bride? But he looks at the bride and she is mangled and weak and spotted and blemished. He said, I can't present this to him. Because Jesus didn't die. He did not die so that his reward could be a tattered, torn up bride. He died for a spotless, powerful bride. And in John 16 and 8, Jesus said, this spirit of truth, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The word convict, somebody can come and help me, I'm done. The word convict means to gently bring into the light. How many of you ever felt condemnation in your life? You've had somebody say something to you, you've had the devil whisper things into you and you felt condemned. All right, put your hands down. Condemnation is harsh. It is meant to be harsh. Comes across hard. It's like, you ever been in a dark room and somebody just walks in and flicks on the light without warning? That's uh, enough to get me ready to fight. It's harsh. It, it blinds you. That's what condemnation does. It's harsh. You get hit with it and you feel disoriented and blinded. But how many of you have ever been in a room with a fader on your light? You start that fader real low. You turn the lights on and the lights are dim. You just pull it up. And it exposes what the darkness concealed. Holy Spirit will convict. That's conviction. 
that he gently pulls us into the light. And he shows us, you need to deal with this. I'll be the first to tell you the Holy Spirit has revealed things to me about me that I didn't want to deal with. And then I would go to pray and the Holy Ghost is like, we're not praying anything else until you deal with this. Start speaking in tongues. Stop. You need to deal with this. And he gen- a gentle reminder. Gently reminding me. And when he reveals what was concealed, the response to exposure is repentance. It's God, Holy Spirit, you've revealed this to me. And you are doing your job because you want to present me as a purified bride to Christ. I repent and I ask you to wash me of this. And and help me to be disciplined. To not fall back into this again. And the Holy Spirit leads you. And as long as he's leading you. When you come at that thing that trapped you the first time. The Holy Spirit says, wait, discern the moment. This is where you got trapped last time. And instead of walking into the trap, the Holy Spirit takes you by the hand and leads you around it. And now he's done his job. And I I don't know about you. We've, We've got some announcements we need to make and I need you to hear them so bear with me they're important I don't know about you I don't want the communion of the Holy Spirit just on Sunday morning I've prayed that when my children are baptized in the Holy Spirit I really don't care where he does it just want them to have it. I just, God, would you just do it in their bedroom? Would you just do it in our living room? Would you do it at the kitchen table? Would you do it because we decided that we were going to commune with you? Not, not just on Sunday morning when Daddy gets up to preach. But we decided to commune with you. And, and to build you a chair that when you come into the old field house, you're not going to break this chair. You're not going to break this chair. And if you break it, we'll build another one. And we'll be obedient to what you want us to build. I don't want communion today and not tomorrow. I want it today and tomorrow and Tuesday, but communion comes by your choice to set aside time and fellowship with the Holy Spirit. A very good friend of mine, stand on your feet with me. I'm going to help you with maybe some practical thing here. A very, very, very good friend of mine, one of my best friends in the world. If I said his name, you'd know him. He was on a fast one time and he was, he, the Holy Spirit told him, he was, he was on a specific fast, he was eating breakfast and there were some other things, but the Holy Spirit told him his routine was to sit down at breakfast and turn on the TV and watch TV while he ate breakfast. And he said the Holy Spirit told him that for the next space of time that whenever he sat down to eat breakfast, to turn the TV off and pull up a chair next to him wherever he was eating and to talk to that chair like the Holy Spirit was sitting in it. Because the Holy Spirit is all around us. To talk to Jesus like he was right there. We make prayer and communion so complicated. I'm I'm conversing with God. I'm I'm having a conversation. And as much as I talk, shh, and listen, And the result of fellowship is partnership. 
And some of you might sit down at that proverbial breakfast table and God might say, I need you to go to Kroger and I need you to go down this aisle and there's going to be a woman there and I need you to tell her this and I'm going to heal her body. Some of you, that terrifies you. But if you commune with the Holy Ghost long enough, you'll start to trust what you hear because he's the spirit of truth. He doesn't lie. Yeah. So if you're in the room today, I'm going to do this simply. We're not going to belabor the point because this is a message that you have to carry into tomorrow. I can't lay my hands on you and impart something that you won't have the discipline to continue. But if you say today, Pastor, I hear you, and I want to step into another level of communion with the Holy Spirit. And when I say another level, maybe there's some of you in the room, you're already doing that, but you just want to go deeper. Maybe some of you in the room, you, you don't know where to start. Start with breakfast in the morning while you're talking to him. And yeah, your kids might be there. Do it with them. You know, the other night, we were, my daughter was laying in bed, and, and I pray over them every night. I pray the same thing every night. Father, let your angels encamp around them. Sing songs over them while they're sleeping. Protect them in the night. And my four-year-old rolled over to me, Jocelyn, and she said, Dad, she said, why do angels encamp around us? I said, they're protecting you. They're protecting your mind. They're protecting your heart, your body. And they're singing songs over you. She said, can we see angels? I said, I've seen them. I felt them. You think I'm crazy. Some of you are looking at me like I'm nuts. And so I said, right there in that moment, I said, Jocelyn, I said, ask Jesus. She said, Jesus, Will you let me see an angel? Amen. And some of you are like, that's weird. And the day that she sees an angel, God is going to answer a prayer in her faith. And we do that with all sorts of stuff. I'll ask my daughter at the most random times, Jocelyn, what's the Lord saying to you? One time she said, the Lord's saying I need to obey my parents. She for real said that. I'm not kidding. Right now it's head knowledge. It hasn't gotten to her heart yet. But I ask her, Jocelyn, what's the Lord saying to you? When Gwen gets old enough, when Tobin gets old enough, what's the Lord saying to you? I'm building a seat. I'm building a space of communion. A building a seat where the weight of God's glory can come and he won't break a chair in my house if you're in the room and you say I want to go to another level of communion and I am committing today that God will not break a chair in my house I want you to throw both hands up and I want you to commit that to God out of your own mouth right now father I thank you in this moment right here what you're doing what you're saying what you're speaking the brooding of your spirit over this room now god you're churning hearts you are you are convicting hearts right now god that we have lived in a space and time with weak chairs we've lived in a space and time where you've broken many chairs and god i pray today that you would find a church who has built a throne that you can sit on and it will not break that the kavod the weightiness the shekinah of god will sit and rest here and the chairs will not break but healing will come deliverance will come rivers will flow from this house God Lord I thank you that in the homes of every individual who is represented in this house in my heart in my life in my home God I build you a throne I build you a seat you don't have to come in and look very long it's right in the front door you don't have to come and search very long you can find a seat right in the living room find it in the bedroom God Lord I I pray for a deeper level. I pray an impartation over the room of discipline for another level of communion. God, if they only spend 30 minutes, I pray a discipline for 45. If they spend 45 minutes, I pray a discipline for an hour. God, I pray a discipline for communion. We'll sit upon these people. We'll sit upon this house and we will commune with the Holy Spirit and you will reveal Jesus to us and we will partner with you. To see your will and your goal and your kingdom established in the earth. In the mighty name of Jesus we pray. And if you believe it and come in agreement with me, shout amen. Amen, amen, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, put your hands together, give Jesus praise. 
and be seated while you're doing it. Amen. If you got anything out of the word this morning, just say amen. Amen. I cannot preach this into you. You have to determine to do it. You have to be determined to do it and disciplined to do it. Thank you for joining us today. Please consider subscribing to our podcast. You can also find us on Instagram and Facebook by searching up Potter's House Columbus. Have a great week, Potter's House.